Well, Mozart was very, very gregarious. He loved company at, at all levels of society. And his friendship with people like Haydn and, and the clarinetist Anton, Anton Stadler, very well uh, documented. Less documented, really, are his friendships with women. And we've put together this programme about his relationships with all sorts of women, including actually his mother and his sister, so his close family come into this concert. Uh, the first woman he fell in love with, uh, the one he married, who happened to be her sister, and uh, another of his star singers, uh, who became actually one of the most important soprano muses for him. So uh, this is not in any way to make a point necessarily about women, but it's all fantastic music and reflects his relationships with women at all stages in his life. Mozart's first love, really his first love, was Aloysia Weber, who is an extraordinary girl, one of four incredibly gifted sisters. They remind me a little bit of the Bronte sisters, actually, in that they were all very artistic, they were very musical and phenomenal singers. Of these four singers, the eldest, Josefa, was the first queen of the night. So she was obviously a good singer. Uh, the second was Aloysia, who was Mozart's first love. The third, Constanza, was the one Mozart eventually married. And the fourth, Sophia, was not exactly a singer, though she tried a little acting at one point. But actually, we love Sophie too, because she was the sort of carer of the family and basically looked after them all through births and marriages and indeed deaths. It was Sophia who held Mozart in his arms when he died. So these girls were amazing uh, and particularly they were amazing singers and Constanza is often dismissed, uh, has been through the centuries as being completely inadequate as a wife for Mozart and being a, a sort of vulgar airhead. She was anything but that. She was certainly a lively girl who enjoyed a good time. Uh, but like her sisters, she'd been very well educated by her father and spoke many languages and was a good singer. As we tell in this concert, by the excerpt that we are going to do from the C minor mass, which is a piece Mozart wrote for her to sing, and the Et Incarnatus Est, which is the heart of any mass anyway, uh, is a solo for her with three obbligato instruments, flute, oboe, bassoon, same combination incidentally he uses throughout his operas. Think of Pamina's aria, etc, etc. Um, and we can tell from that what a good singer she was. But at the same time in this concert we are doing the amazing aria, Vorrei spiegarvi Dio, which Mozart wrote for Aloysia. Now Aloysia had, as I said, was his first love. She actually got bored with him when he went away and married somebody else and, and sort of broke his heart. Uh, but when they all ended up in Vienna a few years later, neighbours as well as um, tense relations in that he had married her sister by then, there was a great rapprochement. And in fact, Aloysia became again this great muse for Mozart. Because, because of her gifts. I, she was the sort of Rene Fleming of her day, actually. For all that her sister Josefa had those amazing high notes, and as we can tell, uh, Constanza was a fine singer too. Aloysia was the one. She was clearly phenomenal. Because not only did she have an amazing technique, as we hear in this aria, but she had an astonishing range, almost as high as the Queen of the Night. This, this aria goes up to an E. Queen of the Night goes to an F, but it's it's just wonderfully expressive and dramatic and it's also clearly written with great love. So we tell a lot, we can tell a lot about these sisters from the music he wrote for them. The concert aria Chiomi Scordite is sort of different from every other Mozart concert aria because it has a piano solo in it uh, and a substantial one. Obviously he played it himself. So it was written, as he wrote in his own catalogue, for Madame Storis and me. Uh, and Madame Storis being Nancy Storis, the half English, half Italian, amazing singer, who had been, in 1786, 
the first Susanna in Le Nozze di Figaro. And in working with her on Figaro, I mean, Susanna is probably the ideal woman for somebody like Mozart. She's just an amazing role. And I think we can see a lot of the character of Nancy Storis actually in the character of Susanna. Uh, but they became very, very close friends. And when Nancy decided to move back to London after a long period of travel in Europe and a sort of disastrous marriage in Vienna, she decided to go back to London where she'd come from. And this aria, Kiyomi Scorre di Te, uh, was Mozart's sort of farewell present for you, for her. And the, indeed the first line, Kiyomi Scorre di Te, Can I Ever Forget You, is quite symbolic, I think. And the fact that he played the piano himself meant that this was a, a real partnership and a symbol of that. And of course it's lovely for us to have doing this, our two soloists in the evening, these two fabulous young talents, which is what Mozart and Nancy were when they performed. And uh, so this is in a way going to be one of the, heart, one of the hearts of our programme. So for uh, Nancy Storis, we, and indeed uh, Constanza and Aloysia Weber, we have the young Jennifer France, one of the most amazing talents to be soaring her way into the profession right now. Um, it's lovely for me to work with her on this occasion. Uh, when I was director of opera at the Royal Academy of Music, she was one of my students and was obviously going to be destined for higher things. And within a f couple of years of leaving the Academy, she's doing so well. And, it's, and I know she has the range. She's got those incredible top notes, but she also has to have the low notes too. And Jenny will be supplying all that and a great personality. And then with her uh, playing this uh, part, as well as the fabulous piano concerto, is Lauren Zhang, who of course was the Young Musician of the Year for the BBC last year and likewise is making huge headway in the profession. So as the LMP celebrates its 70th birthday, as do certain musicians, um, it's wonderful to have young talent among us too. The piano concerto is something that Mozart almost invented. I mean, of course there were keyboard concertos before Mozart, but he really, through putting on concerts for himself in Vienna in the 1780s, for him to play with an orchestra that he would pull together, uh, he really pushed the piano to the fore as a, a, a solo instrument with orchestra. Um, and changed the dynamic and the, and the whole sort of range of piano concertos, adding larger and larger orchestras. And although he'd started quite modestly uh, in Salzburg, the last one he wrote in Salzburg was the one we are playing here, uh, the E-flat concerto K271, known as the Jeune Homme concerto for various complicated reasons, maybe the name misspelled of the woman who first played it. But the reason we all come back to it again and again and again is that although he was a very young man when he wrote it, he actually, I think, showed tremendous maturity. And this is no longer uh, the sort of brilliant fumblings of somebody uh, prodigious and making his way. This is an incredibly grown-up concerto uh, that has everything one would want from wit to lyricism and that almost extraordinarily Shakespearean ability to make you laugh and cry at the same time. As well as our two wonderful young soloists there are of course a couple of items for the orchestra alone and uh, for me coming back to the orchestra after all these years and those happy happy days we had together in the 80s uh, it's lovely to revisit a lot of the repertory that we did together, including the Paris Symphony, uh, which of course uh, fits into our programme for sli the slightly sad reasons that uh, it's, that's where his mother comes into it. Uh, it. Mozart wrote the Paris Symphony when he was on a trip to Paris to try and get a job. His mother was with him uh, and his mother sadly died actually in Paris. So there's a bit of sweetness to this brilliant, brilliant symphony. It's uh, 
Also significant, however, because it was the first time he actually used clarinets in the orchestra. He had heard them on the way through to Paris in Mannheim and wrote to his father, you have no idea what an orchestra sounds like when it has clarinets in it. They didn't have clarinets in Salzburg. He said, if only we had clarinets too, it would be so amazing. And by the time he got to Paris, he found clarinets in the orchestra and wrote gleefully for them. And so for the first time in the Mozart canon, we get the full classical wind complement of flutes, oboes, clarinets, bassoons, horns, trumpets and timbs, as well as strings. So it's, his, it, it's joyful for that reason. It's uh, a little sad for the reason that his mother died and was so ill and then died at the time that he was writing it. But that's why we're playing that. And then to introduce the whole program really, which sort of wraps up the whole theme of it, we have to do, do we not, Così fan tutte, the overture to Così fan tutte, all women are like that, is this ridiculous sort of sub-translation of it. But hey, it's a great overture and lots of fun and introduces the tutte of the, of the program.